How does an identity become? Human selves are forged in a social crucible. When humans are young, we fall in love, and we can feel the boundaries keeping our identities distinct, melting away. Symbols pass between minds, and a neural facsimile of the other comes to live inside ourselves, becomes ourselves. Human identities are unique in this capacity to be so strongly modified symbolically, but the root of these experiences runs extremely deep. To get at the origin of our unusually amorphous human selfhoods, we need to go as far back as we can to the origin of life and the first selves. Every kind of selfhood begins with differentiation with the distinction between inside and out. But the distinction cannot be perfect, because to completely wall yourself off from your environment is in a way equivalent to completely blending into it. In both cases, any potential for interaction is lost, and agency disappears. Life is not a static distinction between within and without, but a process through which the inside and the outside waver and interpenetrate. The tree of life, when viewed in its entirety, possesses trillions upon trillions of branches. Yet among the countless bifurcations, a select few stand out as particularly notable, the aptly called major transitions. What is striking about these pivotal branch points is that they are not actually branchings at all. Quite the opposite, they are fusions, anastomosis. The most important episodes in the history of life are periods of symbiogenesis, where the boundaries of single organisms blur and intermingle, anastomosing into a new, collective identity. These anastomosis events deserve listing. One, the origin of life. Two, the first cells and DNA. Three, endosymbiosis. Four, multicellularity. Five, symbolic language. It is this last transition that I wish to focus my research on, although throughout I will emphasize the continuity of the tree of life and the similarities that the symbolic transition bears with earlier transitions. These fusions have been studied to varying depth, but rarely under one continuous paradigm. I believe that detailed inquiry at one of these loci can lead to fruitful insights at another. For example, the evolution of multicellularity hints at intriguing strategies as to how we might organize human groups. The path through design space that led to the genetic code ought to resemble the pathway that led to symbolic language. Ultimately, I strive to develop a rigorous isomorphism between these transitions, culminating in a general theory of how selfhood evolves. How does an identity become? I want to argue that a new kind of selfhood is emerging, a global identity that encompasses not just humanity, but all of the plants and animals that we have domesticated to live within the boundaries of our society. Those boundaries are no longer dermal, but symbolic. And with this shift, genes have lost their monopoly as the exclusive information carrier of biological identity. We differentiate ourselves and our social groups from the rest of the world through the use of symbols, and we use those symbols to ensure the proper inheritance of the phenotypic traits of those groups over time. Groups can indeed have phenotypic traits. For example, the lack of a foreskin in Jewish males is a group-level phenotypic trait of Judaism, where the corresponding genotype is to be found not within the genome of its members, but within its holy texts. My passion lies less in scientific discovery than in its communication. The uncovering of novel biological facts requires fine-grained attention to thousands of ambiguously relevant details. This is an essential practice, but exclusive attendance to the tips of life's cladogram 
often prevents us from perceiving the entire tree. I prefer to focus less on the individual facts and more on the weaving of those facts into narrative. Amidst the scientific details we already have lie all the threads needed for a new cosmology more spiritually motivating than anything that has come before it. If only we can weave them together. I believe there is a vital and yet somehow forgotten place in academia for not just canalized fact discovery, as all the discipline sciences have become, but for broad and creative fact integration. What I am concerned with here is meaning making. How does an identity become? How did there come to be creatures with selves, creatures for whom the world is meaningful? Symbolism can give the question some emotional resonance. Early alchemists answered with the Ouroboros, a symbol that likely originated before writing. The oldest depiction of the self-consuming serpent that I know of is this pre-dynastic Egyptian palette dated approximately 5,200 years ago. The Ouroboros is significant because it indicates that even the most cladistically basal human cultures had a deep understanding of this paradox of life. So, how does meaning get made? In the process of consuming its flesh, the Ouroboros simultaneously sustains and violates its own boundaries, and an incomplete wholeness emerges. This self-penetrating pattern is seen across the tree of life, is its defining characteristic. The simplest form the Ouroboros takes is described in molecular models of the origin of life, like Deacon's autogen. A reciprocally catalytic chemical reaction produces the molecules needed to build a barrier. The barrier localizes and limits the reaction that generated it. This ensures the system's perpetuation through time. Each component creates the conditions necessary for the perpetuation of the other. Each component also constrains those conditions so that the reactions don't run to equilibrium, as either process would, in isolation. Thus, the system as a whole both sustains and violates the processes of its component parts. The Ouroboros also provides insight into the nature of DNA. All creatures with genomes literally contain themselves, along with the Gerdelian paradox implied. There is a strange kind of self-sufficiency in this. The DNA lies static at the center, inert and yet oddly dynamic. Countless proteins buzz around it, zipping, unzipping, transcribing, shuffling tiny strings of it outside into an even greater tumult of activity. Outside, the strings become active, contorted around themselves, sliced up, rearranged, and translated into new forms by twisted clumps of other strings which originated from the same inert center as all the rest. The entire system is contorted around itself, reading itself, reading a string of meaning which manifests itself through the act of reading. Life isn't just a machine that makes itself. It's also a sort of serpent that eats itself, and a book that reads itself. The DNA just points. It means nothing on its own. But there's a system of meaning built up around it, because of it. Somewhere in the tumult comes the capacity to represent the outside world, but ultimately, what any strand of DNA is about is how a system of parts relates to its self. In employing the Ouroboros, the alchemists were declaring the self-satisfying significance of their practice. Alchemy was equally concerned with the effects it had on its practitioners, as the effects it had on the world. It highlighted that all inquiry was carried out by embodied selves, and that all insights can only have relevance with respect to those selves. Our science was derived from their alchemy, but paradoxically, it became so obsessed with its prized Cartesian knife 
that it forgot that this is precisely the tool that it uses to eat its own tail. Now, the only kinds of statements science recognizes are of a fractured external ontology. What was once self-satisfying looping became self-denying closure. Meaning was divided into matter and motion. I began this video by describing my desire to narrativize the ongoing symbolic major transition that is transforming the world. This narrative is complicated by the fact that the science that can reveal the story's structure is also actively participating in its development. The Ouroboros is present at all scales. We are long past the point where it is tenable to believe that we can observe the world without affecting it. This means that all these convoluted words spiraling through me demand a form of expression far more physical than an academic theory. My credentials are atypical. While other applicants were interning as research assistants, I was in a dumpster, exploring the politics of intentional community. For me, this was not a diversion, but a practice towards achieving my final goal, just as much practice as writing this essay is. I intend to use these abstractions to build community. As I sketch a picture in rhetoric, the parts that are furthest away from this black, squiggly medium necessarily get diminished. But let me try, anyway, to describe the praxis that can actually only be manifested in wood and green fields, in bread and in laughter. I want to build a school with the same kind of ouroboric looping as an organism. A school where students don't attend because they see their tuition and time as an instrumental trade for a career down the line, but because they understand themselves to be part of something greater than themselves, and want to better contribute to its functioning. This would be a school where the dynamics of multi-level selection would be discussed in the garden while weeding, and where office hours would be shared in the kitchen while making dinner. A school where the origin of life is taught in the form of a passion play, outside, in a field filled with music and larger-than-life papier-mâché phospholipid bilayer puppets. I fail to understand why most biologists teach about life inside ivory boxes suspended in the sky. So, I am applying to graduate school not just because I am seeking a career in academia, but because my ideas and communication skills require rigorous cultivation before they can effectively further this project. Most who are drawn to academia see education as both a means and an end. I want to make this recursion explicit. I see a school which provides community and self-satisfying significance for all of its members. A place where the roles of student, farmer, professor, and janitor are given the space to blend. I am trying to translate a truncated version of myself to you into symbolic form. I hope that if I have not conveyed the details of my thought, I have at least conveyed its breadth a personal mythology. Mythological thinking is often seen as antithetical to science, yet to me its necessity is self-evident. Only very recently has the concept of myth become equated with untrue, and this is a false parody. A true statement has two aspects. It needs to be objectively, factually correct, but it also needs to be subjectively meaningful. Mythology was the first language humanity invoked to try to understand itself, and myths still affect us on a mental level that the precise, quantified terminology of today usually fails to influence. Robust understanding comes just as much from well-defined concepts as it does from emotional resonance. So, in my writing, I seek to tell stories that are as evocative as they are factually valid, 
stories that inspire their watchers to seek beyond themselves. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments.